today. It's a pleasure to have so many people uh, join for such a important but often underestimated topic, I think, in understanding international politics. We're very uh, lucky to have uh, two very uh, distinguished guests uh, joining us today. First, we have Max Hess, who's a Central Asia Fellow at FPRI, and second, Niva Yao, who's a researcher at the OSC Academy in Bishkek, both uh, experts with uh, deep expertise in Central Asian politics and the international uh, aspects of Central Asian affairs. So we're delighted to talk to them about uh, great power competition in Central Asia and how different powers such as Russia, China, the United States, and other, uh, other countries uh, in the region or adjacent to the region uh, are approaching Central Asia uh, today. This is, of course, an interesting time to look at Central Asia, uh, given the polarization of international politics that we uh, see uh, happening in, in, in real time. And Central Asia is, of course, being impacted by many of these uh, global trends. Before uh, we launch into the conversation, a couple of uh, housekeeping points. First, uh, I'll start by posing some questions to Neva and to Max, uh, but then we'll reserve the second half of our conversation for questions from you. So you can input any questions that you have into the chat box, uh, and then I'll pick out questions uh, during the second half of our uh, time together and pose them uh, to Neva and to Max. Uh, also, I encourage anyone who's not uh, currently subscribed or a member of FPRI to, to do so. You can do so on our website and participate in, in these conversations and more. So please uh, check out FPRI.org if you haven't already uh, signed up or become a member. Um, if you have any uh, problems with, with uh, the Zoom software, feel free to chat us as well, and we can try to get them sorted. You'll note that everyone is, is on mute except for our speakers, uh, just to make sure that the audio uh, is, is loud and clear. So I will begin uh, by turning to Neva, who is based in Bishkek right now, so an interesting uh, place to watch Central Asian affairs. And, uh, Neva, you've done a great deal of work on how China thinks about the region. Obviously, there's a very long history of uh, Chinese interaction with Central Asia, though in recent decades, actually, uh, there's been been much less, uh, except for the past couple of years, there's been a substantial ramp up, I think, in, in Beijing's interest in the region. Um, we have hear a lot about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, how should we think about how Beijing is looking at Central Asia today? So um, if I want to address what China wants the most in Central Asia, I need to first unpack a few things. So first of all, in order to understand Chinese foreign policy, it's all about the survival of the CCP. And for many years, it's quite responsive. So after the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989, we see that you know, China was trying to convince the Western world that it can be more responsible. So it opened up its markets, it um, you know, had a lot of economically liberalization policies, and it, was, it worked. I mean, five years later, Tiananmen Square incident, you know, the Clinton administration detached human rights conditions and you know, trade benefits. So for China, it's been working okay. And you know, since 2010s, there's this shift from just being responsive to the international community, but actually China wants to take a stand and you know, create a legitimate existence on the international stage. So that's the first thing. Second thing is you know, how Chinese leaders see Central Asia. This is you know, more interesting, like, um, you know, like we said a bit just now before the meeting, China in, you know, in, in some, China's leaders don't care about Central Asia and there's a lot of long history to it. Um, so as we all know, China is, you know, four or 5,000 years old. And for majority of that part of history, if not all parts of that history, even though China was a unified state or it was split into 14 different states, along that border of China to the western part of, of, of China or, you know, Central Asia today, they have had this problematic relationship with the nomads for, you know, as I said, four or five thousand of years. And what this has meant is that it's created this sense amongst political elites in China that whoever that goes and has to deal politically with this western region is considered as a political exile. And from day one, we see all these, you know, lists of um, politicians from, you know, the central part or from the eastern coast of China that um, did something wrong. They are, you know, on exile to the western region. And this is even today is still the same. The, um, the Chinese diplomat that failed 
in negotiating a deal with the British in, in, uh, during the opium trade war uh, was exiled to Xinjiang immediately. And you know, this, the list goes on. And so there is still this sense amongst you know, Chinese political leaders or scholars that you know, this Western region or Central Asia is not really an appealing area to look at. It's almost as if you're not good enough you know, to look at anything, but that's why you're looking at Central Asia. So even the Chinese scholars today that do look at Central Asia, Central Asia is the last thing they write about. They write about Russia, they write about Afghanistan, but to write about Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan is something that is so not very, you know, prestigious. And Chinese leaders don't want to do with Central Asia. So how do these two things come together? You know, how, to, how we understand Chinese foreign policy and, and, and how we understand Chinese leaders don't care about Central Asia. Um, so if we go back to Chinese foreign policy a little bit, um, CCP is legitimate on mainland because they want the Chinese Civil War. And the core to the survival of CCP is Taiwan. And it's not a ter territorial thing because you have a political entity in Taiwan that directly challenges CCP as the legitimate government of China. And according to Taiwan's use of the, the map is from Qing Dynasty, this actually means that what Taiwan wanted to do for a long time was to become the legitimate government of the entire China in the Qing Dynasty period, which actually includes parts of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. But of course, there's a constitutional change in Taiwan and they no longer want that. But the perception in Beijing is that Taiwan, the political leadership there, can still challenge the CCP. OK, so this is about Central Asia. Why am I talking about Taiwan? OK, so for years, China cannot invade Taiwan because when, it, when Taiwan was you know, very active about independence and so on and so forth, it, China almost started a war with the U.S. And that was in 1955 and 6. You know, and all U.S. ever did was to allow the president of Taiwan at the time to, fit, to visit Cornell University to give a speech. That was it. That was enough for China to fire missiles into Taiwanese territories. And so China cannot invade Taiwan because they will start a war with the U.S., but also China will jeopardize all the relationships with all of its neighbors. So South Korea and Japan depend on the pathway through Taiwan for all of its trade, basically. And that's not just importing, but exporting. And so it's the same for Southeast Asia. So in this hostile time of you know, late 1990s and early 2000s, you know, political leadership sitting in Beijing was thinking, OK, we need to develop another trade route. How do we do that? And that's where Central Asia comes in. OK, so in 1999, there was a great Western development plan that was thought of and drew up. Okay, and you might ask, okay, 1999 was when China, you know, started to have money, so that's why they wanted to develop the poor parts of the country. But throughout 1950s, all the way to 1980s, when China didn't have money, it was sending billions of aid to Africa instead of developing its own territories. So China only decided to actually invest and build infrastructure in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in 1999. For a long time, they didn't care because Beijing, the leadership in Beijing, don't care about the central and western regions. Yeah? So in order to understand what China wants in Central Asia, in, 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 in some, they are trying to, a step by step, build a viable trade route westward in order to increase economic resilience in, prepar in preparation to invade Taiwan. So this is a, a fascinating, I think, uh, perspective on the region. It's, it's putting Central Asia in the context of these broader uh, global, global shifts. Another one of these global uh, themes that we've heard a lot about from Beijing is, is the One Belt, One Road project, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, called by, by different names, which uh, was announced first in Kazakhstan several years ago, but now has kind of gone global. How should we think about what is the Belt and Road in Central Asia and what are Beijing's goals uh, when it talks about the Belt and Road uh, with reference to Central Asian countries? Yeah, so if you actually look at the white paper of the Belt and Road Initiative, which was released in 2015, it's called the Vision and Actions uh, to Jointly Build the, the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road and the, you know, the rest of it, sorry, it's a really long name. 
Um, so if you actually look at the substance of it, you can see that none of that is new in terms of what China's been doing um, overseas, but why they repackaged everything and branded it was, you know, what, this was at a time when President Xi Jinping just became the president and him as a character needed something to show to the world that, you know, he was being very serious about this and, you know, he's like doing a lot. And this also came at a time when the Chinese economy really started to slow down and he needed a reason to justify to the Chinese citizens that why is he spending money in Cambodia? Why is he spending money in Kyrgyzstan? Why, are, why is he giving, you know, debt forgiveness to Ethiopia when, you know, all these Chinese citizens are suffering? Why don't we spend more money? In the rural areas, so he needed that, and he needed to justify the Belt and Road as you know build, building friendships overseas, and it's actually benefiting China. And so it, when so when I looked at what China actually done in in Central Asia, you know, since 2013, it's actually a continuation of things that they have already done. And but the new things that they have you know really stepped up from doing is building connections, building you know friendships with the political leaders. Um, in Central Asia, and that's not just you know the politicians. That's, um, for example, schools, uh, school principals. So even um, like industry industry leaders, um, textile leaders, um, village leaders, uh, music kind of performance leaders. So China kept organizing these Belt and Road Music Festival, and they invite all these you know developing countries leaders and singers from you know all over the world. And when they arrive. China, they get pampered, you know, they get put into nice hotels, they get, you know, all these gifts that China would give them. And I think for Xi Jinping, what was successful in the 1970s when China was able to buy a lot of votes from African countries in order to, you know, for China to be admitted in the, into the UN to replace Taiwan, he thinks that, you know, this is an investment for when all these countries around the world will also support China in the years to come. When it's fascinating listening to that list of, of activities that fall under the Belt and Road. I think we normally think of the Belt and Road as being about ports or roads or bridges. Uh, but in fact, as you've noted, there's also musical groups and, and even bookstores that are falling under the rubric of Belt and Road in, in Central Asia. Could, could you give us a sense of how decision-making about Belt and Road happens. We, we use the phrase Beijing to refer to the Chinese policy making process, but obviously there are different actors within the government in Beijing. There are state owned companies, there are, are private traders. How are decisions actually made in Beijing with regard to Central Asia? So, of course, there are overarching mechanisms. So, there is a small group of um, five people that coordinates the Belt and Road all over, um, for all over the world. But those people actually turn out to be more of the administrative people that like frames the Burton Road, but not necessarily the people who thinks about what to do for the Burton Road. So even though when you look at the white paper, there are quite specific things that um, they lay out, for example, for trade, they will have, okay, let's build more industrial parks um, all over the world. So in Central Asia, for example, every Central Asian country now, apart from Turkmenistan, has a Chinese industrial park. Um, Tajikistan has two actually, uh, but then, then, then they all different, um, they all, uh, they all, you know, it's a different category. So, for example, the one in Kyrgyzstan is on agriculture. The one in Tajikistan is on textiles and uh, mining. So, even though the white paper says just build industrial parks, it's up to the the private companies and the state-owned enterprise, the people that will actually implement these things to actually interpret the the white paper. So, in a way. China wanted to, or President Xi Jinping wanted to just have a very broad frame of what this is and then just let everyone that wants to please him to do what they can in their capacity, which is why, you know, like you said, there are bookstores that are Belt and Road themed. There are um, tea, tea house restaurants that are Belt and Road themed. Everyone wants to connect themselves with the Belt and Road in order to, you know, please, you know, person is Jinping and, and put in the report and say, I have done this for the bed and wrote. And this is the same, you know, more or less in academia as well. You have a lot of overseas bed and road research institutes, but why are they called bed and road? Why are they set up just to study the bed and road? This is for, you know, when they come to interact with the 
Chinese people or the Chinese friends that they will be able to say that I've done this for the Belt and Road. And, and then that's, where you ha that's how you get you know, more cooperation and with China and things like that. Um, so it's top down to an extent a lot of it depends on act, different actors to respond to what Xi Jinping wants. Yep, that's, that's fascinating. And I think the complexity that you outlined is, is super important in understanding how, how China engages in the region. Let me turn, if I can, to, to Max to um, ask first a question about energy. And we've already gotten uh, two questions from the audience about Turkmenistan, which is actually a country that Max studies quite closely. So let me, let me start with the energy angle, Max. Obviously, uh, a period of low oil prices globally is, is not a good thing for Central Asian countries. How are they responding and also how are they managing uh, their, their energy plans um, amid uh, both China and Russia as key energy players in the region? Sure. So Central Asia, obviously, from the Soviet legacy, has significant gas and oil infrastructure uh, that runs through Russia. That's how these networks uh, were originally built when the Soviets first started developing those resources. Um, on the gas uh, side, it's quite a bit more politicized, as China has really ramped up as Central Asia's main gas purchaser over the last 10 years, whereas on the other hand, uh, Russia, which used to transport a decent amount, um, and from Turkmenistan quite a significant amount of uh, gas through Russia and then sell it on to Europe, that market no longer really exists. And, and I think it's very unlikely um, that that market will uh, resume in, in the coming years, given gas dynamics in Europe and what's going on uh, in, in the LNG side. Central Asia, Kazakhstan, we've seen shift a little bit of oil um, out, out through Russia, uh, in part because of some blending uh, price issues in, in March and April in particular. But what's been really uh, interesting has been the headline uh, cut in Chinese gas purchases um, from Central Asia in particular, even as China continues to claim that its gas uh, usage actually went up very slightly in, in the first quarter of the year. Uh, I have some questions uh, about that data, given the size of the cuts to uh, Central Asia, the relative, the, the Russian pipeline that came online in December um, has so far delivered a little over a billion cubic meters. Um, so, so it's just, it's simply not material yet. And then given what's going on with uh, Chinese LNG supplies as well. Part of the issue is that China and these countries have never disclosed their contracts or the terms on which this gas is sold. But through looking at Chinese um, and Central Asian data, we're able to roughly get a picture of it. And so through some work I've been doing for FPRI recently, looking at the Turkmen and Uzbek uh, figures and comparing them to the Kazakh figures, we do seem to see a divergence in what's been happening so far this year. Uh, that would be Turkmenistan, which sells almost exclusively natural gas and very little else to China, as it produces little else, um, has seen imports fall almost 20% so far this year. Kazakhstan overall has seen imports spike, on the other hand, um, and Uzbekistan has seen imports decline as uh, exports excuse me, uh, decline as well, although they are uh, slightly more diversified than not just gas. The mix in normal times, or we'll say last year, roughly broke up to 30 billion cubic meters of Turkmen gas and 10 billion cubic meters of Kazakh and uh, Uzbek gas being sold annually to China uh, with plans to slightly increase those over the coming years. The um, the the issue that we see now is based on data that Cosmo Nagas, the state company of Kazakhstan, put out. It does appear that some of these increased sales um, of gas from Kazakhstan are actually going to China. So essentially, we have a situation where China is cutting Uzbek and Turkmen gas imports while uh, increasing Kazakh gas imports. This may very well be due to price arbitrage situations. There seems to be some of that going on with China's activity in LNG markets as well, liquefied natural gas, which it imports significant amounts of as well. Um, we so far don't know how long that trend will hold, but I think it's rather interesting that it's doing that. Um, I personally believe it may have to do with some of the price, but really over the the medium term, the situation doesn't really change much for Central Asia on the gas front. China pl does plan on increasing domestic gas usage, taking off more coal power. Um, these are very concrete targets the Chinese Communist Party has, has laid out for a number of years and does not um, appear set to, to change them. They're also separate from, from its you know, Paris Agreement and other um, environmental requirements. These are more general um, economic policy plans. Um, but 
because of the price dynamics that are going on now and with the amount of global gas that's due to come online in the next year or two in competition from US, Qatari, um, Australian LNG, as well as the fact that the Russian uh, power of Siberia pipeline is meant to eventually go to 30 billion cubic meters annually, the same as Turkmenistan um, supplied last year, uh, that because of, of, of that, and because of Turkmenistan, sorry, uh, because of Central Asia's poor geographic position, uh, it doesn't really have the opportunity to sell the gas to anyone else. As I mentioned, that European market is not really there. The attempts to build a Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline are, are not serious and will not be completed under this regime in Turkmenistan or, or Afghanistan. Um, a route is not uh, as well. So, Central Asia will continue to eventually go buying the same large amounts of, of gas to China if its economy um, does does recover in full uh, from, from the COVID pandemic, but we'll see less headline growth driven out of it because it will have even less um, power in, in the sort of price setting dynamic amid this global um, glass gut. So Max, if, if you zoom out, you hear a lot of discussion among uh, many Central Asian leaders about diversification. Um, and obviously for a number of Central Asian countries, there's a from a dependence on oil and gas sales, which as you noted, the price of which is very volatile. Um, what are the prospects in Central Asia for building up other industries uh, besides oil and gas? What efforts are underway and how successful do you think these will be? Sure. Um, uh, their relative success will certainly depend from country to country. I think they're, Uzbekistan's op economic opening up without political reform um, has presented a number of, of opportunities and Tashkent does look to be quite sincere about continuing with that agenda going forward. The question is, is where will these investments come from? And right now the only sort of real still investment partner there is China. You have a, quite a strong bifurcation in the situation between those three gas selling countries and then Tajikistan um, and Kyrgyzstan, which do not sell uh, significant, uh, they do not produce significant amounts of gas or sell it to China. Uh, there was a question about the Line B pipeline, just to address that quickly. That's the idea of a new Turkmenistan gas pipeline running through the mountain areas of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, effectively giving them some gas transshipment fees. I do not expect us to see any significant production on that anytime soon, simply given the global glass gut um, that I was mentioning earlier. The, the investment opportunities in those countries will, as I said, still come from China. And the real question there is, will COVID, um, will this economic situation cause a retrenchment or change in China's thinking uh, on, on Central Asia? What we've seen, as, as I think Neva correctly pointed out, is Central Asia's real big role for, for China is as part of a connecting structure and export route to go through the West. And China does choose to seek to develop more of that through Central Asia rather than Russia itself. I, we're not at the situation where I think it's likely that China and Russia will be openly competing in Central Asia, however. Uh, but what we'll see is that change will come most clearly in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan before we see any change to those investment agendas in Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and, and Turkmenistan, um, although those three are slightly differentiated just given the relative diversification of their economies, but because of the lack of gas in those areas. Kyrgyzstan, we've seen a notable sort of downturn in, in relations with China of late. The former prime minister was just sentenced to jail for a corrupt business dealing with a Chinese company around the power plant. Uh, and it will be hard for the Kyrgyz government, I think, to at least publicly sound extremely positive about more Chinese investment in the short term. Tajikistan is, is another question. Tajikistan is heavily indebted to China, although China has now announced a debt initiative that it's taking part in, in the G20 um, official debt freeze. This isn't really as significant for those two countries because most of the, the debt comes through corporate structures and, and private loan structures through banks. So it's, it's not yet an indication that we'll be seeing uh, any particular change in Chinese policy there. Uh, what I'm most interested in following there is, is Tajikistan, which for reasons that I believe have more to do with its internal dynamics and the extremely corrupt uh, regime uh, of President Nahum, 
uh, will cede potentially more of its sovereignty to China. We know that Tajikistan uh, previously in, in the 1990s gave over some mountain passes. Um, more significantly, uh, a few years ago, it agreed to allow China to have the right to build military bases on the Tajik-Afghan border uh, and installations there. There has been some Chinese activity, but the Chinese haven't fully taken up what they have under those treaty rights that the Tajiks have disclosed. There has now been talk about Tajikistan's sole major domestic enterprise, Talco, um, the Tajik Aluminum Company, uh, which is effectively controlled by, by Rahman's family, um, a potential Chinese investment coming in there and as the only sort of real domestic industry of any note, um, although it is technically a private enterprise, I would see that as part of that same um, agenda there. What is interesting is, uh, uh, one quick point on that, is why I don't think that Russia and China will so far uh, stand off over these issues is because as China's economic influence has grown, Russia's strategy, uh, at least in, in the Putin era, has been r rather consistent, even as we've seen the development of things like the Eurasian Economic Union and um, countries, you know, Uzbekistan joining that as a participatory, as an observer member uh, earlier this year could potentially be seen by some as a signal that it's, you know, keeping the door open to more Russia rather than more China. I don't um, personally see that as the case. But the Russians have really allowed their sort of personal relationships with the elites in a number of these countries uh, to allow them uh, to develop and cultivate political ties. We've seen that through the Nazarbayev, the ruling family in, in um, Kazakhstan, some of whose members have served on Gazprom's board. There's a number of other business and banking connections uh, between them as well. We've seen uh, Russia's investment in, in Gazprom, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we've seen uh, Usmanov, a, a, a very wealthy Russian oligarch who's been linked to the Kremlin before, uh, now bankrolling a lot of in investment in his uh, native Uzbekistan as, as well after staying away under the, the previous um, government of, of the late President Karimov. Um, but, you know, so in, in Tajikistan, Russia attempted this through Talco as well many years ago through Oleg Deripaska and his company uh, Rusal. And it, it's... It, it, the case is ultimately went until 2017. It resulted in 15 years of legal disputes. Um, and in, in my view is one of the reasons why Tajikistan, although it is the most economically dependent on Russia because of its remittance base, um, regardless of any Chinese investment situation, why it has remained outside of the Eurasian Economic Union and why the ties between the Rahman regime and the Kremlin have not been as close uh, as they are elsewhere. So if China does come in and partner there, um, in, in the talco plant, whether it's a, you know intentional part of its strategy or uh, not, um, as as Neva mentioned, some of its activity in Central Asia seems to just be you know let's see what happens and, and take take what's best. Um, that 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 could cause a, a sort of more long term um, political shift there. Uh, but that's sort of where I think is potentially worth watching in the future. I do not, however, expect you know, sort of immediate impact of, of COVID and the resulting economic and including uh, hydrocarbon issues will be that all of a sudden we'll see Russian-Chinese cooperation in Central Asia yet. We may lay the seed works for it in the future, the, the groundwork for it in the future, but uh, I don't think we're, we're certainly not there yet. And um, the U.S. doesn't appear particularly interested in trying to uh, get involved one way or another, whether that be um, directly or, you know, even the hawks in the U.S. who I'm not saying that I think they should do this, but they don't think about trying to um, you know, stimulate Russian Chinese competition in the area where, from a you know geographer geographer's perspective, it would perhaps make most sense too, which speaks to the relative debate in in the U.S. Max, could I pose to you a question uh, that I posed to Neva about decision making? Uh, you know, you mentioned a number of different Russian actors that have interests in Central Asia. Obviously, the government has interests. Mm -hmm. Different business groups and oligarchs that have interests. Um, would you apply a similar model uh, to Russia that Neva did to China, sort of a mix of top down and bottom up? Or, or what's the right metaphor for thinking about uh, how Russia in aggregate makes decisions about its priorities in Central Asia? Sure. So, uh, I mean, on the economic side, uh, I certainly believe that, that the Russian, it is not a top down model of Russia telling Russian state companies or even Russian private enterprises to go move and push into Central Asia. We've seen 
there may be some of that in the Usmanov um, instance. I, I think there are some people who, who would claim that, but I think it's more his interests are aligned with the Kremlin. He genuinely does seem interested in developing uh, th things in Uzbekistan, where there is a lot of potential given how much that was suppressed by the um, sophomoric uh, economic policies of, of the Karamov regime, which did leave Uzbekistan at least with a solid amount of money um, now that, that, that should avoid the, the, the worst concerns going forward. Um, on the economic side and investment into key industries, however, there have been a number of points where those state companies made key decisions to go in. Gazprom Kyrgyzstan um, is, is you know, one, one of the, the most clear examples that came effectively uh, at the same time that Kyrgyzstan agreed to, um, under Russian pressure, to um, expel U.S. forces um, from, from their air base just outside the capital. But at the same time, other Russian businessmen um, uh, have encountered issues in Central Asia, uh, perhaps um, no more uh, a stark example than um, the, the mobile phone company MTS owned by um, uh, Viktor Yevtushenkov um, and his holding company Sistema, uh, which has previously had major issues in Uzbekistan and then a few years ago um, had its assets nationalized in Turkmenistan and, and where the Kremlin did not come in and help. Uh, certain other business relationships are very much cultivated um, by the Kremlin, where they know that they have close ties um, with the local regime. We've seen an uh, individual named Igor Makarov um, involved in Russian um, uh, Turkmen gas and oil relations since since the 1990s, and when uh, the Gazprom deal um, to buy a, a relatively small amount of Turkmen gas was struck again last year, um, he was the individual who'd gone and um, been dispatched to sort of uh, brew that up. On Kazakhstan, it, it, the decision-making process is a bit different, simply given how close the ties are um, and a number of other issues in cross-border. Uh, cross um, but ultimately, the ones that really shape the politics are still very much driven um, by the elites uh, around um, the ruling families of those countries and then in Kremlin-connected businesses on the Russian side. Great, fantastic. Well, we've got a whole range of questions coming in in the chat box. I'm going to try to group them into uh, related questions to see if we can get through uh, most or all of them in, in our remaining time. Uh, there's been a number of questions about a couple of multilateral uh, organizations that have a presence in the region, uh, both the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, uh, which includes the Central Asian countries, as well as uh, Russia and China, and also the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, let me first turn to Neva to ask um, two questions on those. First, uh, how does uh, Beijing see the SCO today? What are its goals and approaches? Uh, and then second, how should we think about um, the Eurasian Economic Union from Beijing's perspective and, and all the discussion we hear about cooperation between Belt and Road and Eurasian Economic Union? Uh, what does that actually mean in practice? Thank you, Chris. Um, well, Chris already knows I'm working on this. Um, China, China's belt and road. There are a lot of things that China cannot unilaterally push Central Asian countries to work together on. So China's actually been doing this via the SEO instead. Um, things like customs and tariffs, especially customs, especially with issuing international driver's permits for drivers that drive between China um, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, there's now been recent developments in the past two years that instead of, you know, these drivers that would usually have to spend 20 days uh, waiting around both borders at both sides, trying to, you know, wait for the officers to check the goods and stuff, now there is a um, new permit system for these drivers. And that's issued under the SEO. This is after, you know, Uzbekistan became more open to trade and Uzbekistan was on board and you know, things were taken to the SEO. And, you know, so China was not able to do things like this just between Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and, and, and China. You know, no, no deal was ever able to be reached. Um, so international logistics is, is one area that, you know, in you know China really needs the SEO you know in order for the BLI to succeed. Another area is um, ICT. Just last year in summer in Bishkek actually there was a new cooperation agreement that was signed um, you know with, with the SEO summit to digitalize um, the SEO member states. Now 
all Central Asian countries have um, digitalization as you know part of their development strategy, but ICT is something that you need a lot of expertise, you need a lot of hardware, and that's where China comes in. And you know we already see all the smart cities, all the Huawei surveillance in all of the big cities in Central Asia that's already been in place. In terms of ICT and the SEO, it's been more interesting because after this cooperation agreement, there's actually been a little bit of competition coming from Kazakhstan and India to propose um, digitalization projects. Now, even Tokayev openly said in, in one of those SEO meetings that you know, we should consider the Astana Hub, um, the new technology park that you know, his initiative in, in the capital. The problem with that is, you know, it has lack of funding and lack of um, expertise and, you know, digitalization is China that is already an expert in. Why not just copy the whole model and bring it to Central Asia? Of course, in the West, you know, you have worries over 5G and things like that. But here for Central Asia, there are just simply no other options. Even when there was a team of um, Indian tech startups that went to meet the SEO Secretary General just a few months ago in Beijing, trying to you know say that okay we you know Indians also can you know help with digitalization for SEO member states, but the Secretary General this year already met Alibaba three times, and that's just Alibaba. They also met three, four other Chinese tech companies. There's just simply no competition there that can really beat Chinese contractors. Yep. So China cannot push some of these things on um, SEO member states. And to do it, they bring it to the table in SEO. And you know, after years of negotiations, and you know, there are countries um, Kazakhstan, for example, that do support digitalization, and so they, you know, have this, you know, go through under SEO so that, you know, Russia can also monitor more or less what's happening. Now, in terms of um, the Eurasian Economic Union, it's, of course, you know, Russia way of being like, okay, I want to be able to monitor the economic activities as well, but the Eurasian Economic Union doesn't stop um, Central Asian countries or the EAEU member states from having bilateral trade agreements with China. So it doesn't affect any of these countries' actual trade, even when it comes to customs and tariffs. Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan are still going by their own rules with China. Now, there's been effort from Russia to want to try and intervene you know, China's economic activities in Central Asia via the Eurasian Economic Union. But this has been faced by really great pushback from Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan has a lot of stake working with China and Kazakhstan would not want to jeopardize that. So, and that's been, you know, one of the biggest push and I don't see this changing in our near future. So I think what we will see is that, you know, the EEU will be working with BRI and what that means is, allowing BLI to take on some of the, the things that the EAEU is doing. So that's, you know, common tariffs, you know, that simplifies a lot of things. That's customs, um, having speedy custom um, for, you know, how products cross from borders actually save a lot of time. And this will help, you know, the cargo trains as well. So these are the things that, you know, in, in practice will actually help cross border trade for the BLI. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Neva. We've got another question uh, that just came in on uh, looking at other powers in the region, which I think is an interesting way to frame it. We've talked a lot about China and Russia as the two uh, most important neighboring powers, but obviously there are others, Turkey, Iran, India, that uh, play a role. India, of course, a new member of the SCO. Uh, Max, when you look at uh, the other neighboring countries in the region, what role do you see them uh, playing uh, relative to countries in Central Asia? Sure. Um, I, you know, on, on the Indian policy making side, I don't really ha have a view there. I think that we do occasionally see this trend in Central Asia that there's always this thought that, oh, we can balance more by um, reaching out to, to Delhi that so far hasn't truly bro borne fruit. 
Um, for some of the other countries mentioned, um, Turkey and Iran, Turkey, we've seen a bit of a turn away from Central Asia, um, uh, at least had been. I think that now we're seeing some renewed interest in particular in investment in Uzbekistan. And I think quietly that could be um, one of the long-term success stories. Um, Iran, you know, having that all other Central Asian investment with Iran has to go through Turkmenistan, which is a very unreliable trade partner, even for other Central Asian countries, having spent almost two years blockading Tajik trucks, um, having had a number of other issues um, um, with its neighbors. Uh, I see is more limited, um, and given the sanctions issue there as well. Two that weren't mentioned that I, I do think have actually are really the epitome of who've been doing more, you know, in terms of question, having more meaningful investments relative to their size, reaping benefits, and surprisingly, at least um, on my view from the China angle, uh, avoiding some tensions there have been South Korea and, and Japan, um, both of which have a long history of, of investing uh, in the region. In part, due, there are ethnic Kazakh communities in, in uh, I think Korean communities in Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan in particular. Um, so there's some natural linkages there. But we've seen a lot of industrial investment by uh, petrochemical firms of late in Turkmenistan. We've seen uh, engineering and other work done by some of the South Korean tribals in, in Uzbekistan, even during the, the Karamov era when it was very hard for any foreign um, businesses to operate there. So I think they're the ones who are sort of slowly um, reaping the benefits and doing more. Now, they will never be able to, in aggregate, offer Central Asia the same kind of development opportunity that linkages with, with China offer, and one, due to you know, the neighboring geography um, of China, um, and secondly, you know, due to the, the sheer size of, of, of the Chinese market, um, both as an outgoing destination and for uh, potential investments. Um, I mean, if Japan made a you know, really big new state push to invest back into Central Asia, that would certainly be interesting. Uh, it would have political ramifications uh, with China as well. Um, and there's always been, you know, that's one of the concerns that I have for the Japanese investments now is that if you do have a say Turkmenistan, where they've been doing a lot of them, if you do have a very um, tumultuous situation there, some kind of change um, to, to the current regime, which I see no indications of, the regime is incredibly closed and doesn't allow um, free reporting, but the economic figures um, and, and indications that we do get out of the country are, are often heartbreakingly bleak. Um, but in, in the situation where China had to intervene there, Japan's investments would not be the ones it would protect for um, relatively obvious reasons. Um, but um, so far, South Korea and Japan, and, and that's not just the trend over the last few years, they are the sort of quiet success story in Central Asia that, that doesn't get um, enough attention elsewhere. Max, one follow-up question. We had um, uh, one or two audience questions about the roles played by multilateral development banks. Um, sure. We've got the uh, Asian Development Bank, which is uh, Japanese-led, the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, which is Chinese-led. Uh, the World Bank obviously plays a role as well, along with the IMF. What, what role do you see these institutions playing? On the one hand, we've got a story of great power competition. But we also have a very institutionalized story of multilateral organizations uh, funding at the exact same time. So how does this interaction work in practice? So um, I, I noted that one of the questions was about um, Chinese development banks and whether they were also pushing alternative energy. Um, we have seen uh, non-Chinese development banks, the Asian Development Bank, very closely aligned with the US, based in the Philippines, um, has done so, uh, the EBRD uh, has done so uh, as well and is increasing uh, its activity in, in Uzbekistan uh, as well and, and will be involved in the recovery efforts, uh, I'm quite sure, at least in Kyrgyzstan. Um, Tajikistan has a uh, long history of complicated relations with the World Bank and other uh, Western official institutions that for some reason they are, keep willing to forgive it. Um, Turkmenistan, however, does, does not cooperate with, with any of these on, on, on a meaningful level. Um, part of the reason, I mean, th because the, the Chinese development banks don't tend to intermediate um, those risks uh, into the financial, into the Western financial system um, that they do do in these countries, but rather through China's own financial system, uh, it may be that there's some more um, uh, alternative energy sources development there coming online um, that we just haven't seen yet, but I, I have not yet. Um, seen the indication of that. While well, we do know um, some of the Western development banks uh, are pushing it, but you know, 
the, the sheer size of the debts and, and how much they've grown to China, at least particularly compared um, to the relative economic size of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan's GDP to China Exim Bank um, uh, and a number of others is pretty noteworthy. I don't think we're going to see, you know, the story about great power competition, I think, around those um, institutions comes uh, on a very high level about you know the structures of the global uh, financial system and, and who you have to go for to for credit uh, when you need it and becomes your lender of last resort. Um, I don't think we're going to see some kind of major shift in the global financial system's power balance and the dollar system uh, away from the U.S. and towards China due to this crisis that really changes it. Um, on the ground in Central Asia. So it's, it's, it's a very much a long-term story, the activity of those there. And if the Chinese do hold out in some kind of debt restructurings, so Kyrgyzstan has asked uh, China uh, for that. And if they don't allow, the, if their private creditors or semi-private state-linked creditors don't take part in the same term as, as some of those Western development banks, you know, we'll see that issue uh, and relations between those competing development finance institutes uh, increase, but it, it'll be, it won't be something that will, you know, immediately um, negatively impact uh, uh, Central Asia, but rather um, uh, will be a more high level um, issue. But Central Asia is certainly an area where we could see some of that play out. Neva, do you have anything to add on, on this question of multilateral institutions uh, in, in Central Asia? I know you've uh, done some work on on how different uh, Chinese institutions are engaging in the region as part of the Belt and Road. Any, anything you'd add to Max's comments? Um, I guess and an add on to you know the SEO question is that actually China has this um, China in initiative within the SEO um, for years actually for over ten years this SEO um, interbank association and also SEO business council. So the way SEO business council works is that every year the SEO will pick, um, you know, or, or the politicians will, you know, give a list of all the businesses that will come to this meeting and they will all come together to basically talk about, you know, what kind of industries to, um, to, to work on in Central Asia. It's kind of like a get together to, to, to work on, you know, a better division of labor. So the SEO Interbank Association is for the SEO to monitor the economic situation with these local banks in, in, in Central Asia. So uh, what China does is that China actually allocates funding for SEO to give out loans. So in, instead of just China, uh, a Chinese state bank giving out a loan to the Kyrgyz government, sometimes what, it, what China does, it, it will allocate a, um, a section of the money to the SEO in order for the SEO member states to decide that, um, okay, we will we'll give out a loan for Kyrgyzstan for this particular project. So there is, you know, in a way, there is a, a sense that, you know, this is a, a, there's a consensus into agreeing that, okay, um, let's have Kyrgyzstan do this and, you know, this, and everyone will know this. And, and what we hopefully will we'll do is that, you know, the Kyrgyz government will, will feel a little bit pressured to actually get this done properly and pay the loans back to SEO and not to China. Now, other banks in terms of AIIB on the Silk Road Fund, to be honest, a lot of the money didn't channel into Central Asia. A lot of the money that channeled to Central Asia from China is either through this SEO mechanism or through the Chinese private banks and the Chinese state-owned banks. Interesting, great. Well, a couple more um, sets of questions that have come up in the chat. One is on uh, the question of Xinjiang. And I guess the, the interesting part of this from my perspective is the, the very limited reaction from Central Asian countries uh, to uh, the repression in Xinjiang. Several years ago, I was reading lots of articles saying this is going to be a big issue in relations between Kazakhstan and China, or Kyrgyzstan and China. But in some ways, the interesting thing to me is actually how limited it's been in the bilateral relationship. Um, maybe, Neva, I'll start with you and then turn to Max. How do we understand this uh, in terms of the policymaking in Central Asia? Is, is it that the governments don't care about the issue, that they feel like they need to prioritize the bilateral relationship instead? Or what's the thought process within governments in the region on this question? Um, so I'm sure the audience here knows the situation in Xinjiang. Um, so none of this is my personal opinion. The, you know, with the national security law that is, you know, in Hong Kong right now, um, I don't want to give any personal opinion. I'm from Hong Kong. So we are all walking on eggshells these days with anything that is, you know, politically sensitive for China. All I would have, what I would say is that from my observation, having lived here for almost over two years now, 
is that um, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are seen by the Central Asians as an outsider. I myself have personally met um, some Uyghurs that have, for example, left China when they were two years old with family, and they've lived in Bishkek for over 20 years and still seen by Kyrgyz as Chinese. Uh, even though they don't properly speak Chinese, it doesn't matter, they still feel very excluded. So in a way, I think Central Asia never had a, that big of a sentiment towards this group of ethnic group. And in order to have such a strong sentiment against China for human rights concerns, it would, first of all, require Central Asians to really value human rights. And I think, you know, as we have all seen in the past 10, 20 years, governments around Central Asia themselves don't treat their own people with that high of a human rights standards anyways, let alone caring about what's happening across the border. And, you know, we're even, even without Chinese investments, I doubt that Central Asian leaders will actually care this much. Great. Max, anything to add on that question? Max, you're, you're muted. Let me... Can you unmute? Thanks. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, no, you know, uh, I, I think you really, really hit it on the head there locally and has a better view than I do. You know, on the Ch Central Asia's lack of options, simply leave it, you know, it, and seeing how vociferously Beijing has responded to the situation there and to others who have criticized it, there's just very little to be gained. Um, for the regimes in Central Asia. We did see the protest activity and a bit of media attention in, in Kazakhstan around some of the uh, Kazakhs who either were um, kept in the camps or, or, or who managed to escape, um, but the regime very much attempted to keep it out of the headlines and, and to avoid uh, negative issues there. And I think part of it has to do perhaps with the democratic deficit in the region, but there's, you know, they do not see there as, as anything relative to be gained by challenging China uh, on that issue. We've had a couple of questions about the role of the U.S. in Central Asia and U.S.-China competition, whether it spills over into Central Asia. Um, obviously, Central uh, Sec Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was uh, in the region not too long ago. Um, what role, if any, is, is the U.S. playing in Central Asia uh, right now? Max, I'll, I'll start with you and then and turn back to Neva. Sure. So both the U.S. and the EU in the last year updated their um, strategy documents for uh, Central Asia, and there was not, in my view, really any substantive change. Uh, on the Pompeo visit, it was also uh, having that kind of visit to Tashkent would not have been possible um, uh, um, in, in the with the same investment speech um, under the Karimov regime. So that was perhaps the the most significant. Um, development there. We've seen occasional half-hearted attempts by Turkmenistan to reach out a tiny bit more to the U.S., Kazakhstan, because of its relative integration into Western financial networks, certainly far more than, than any other Central Asian country, um, ha has some of those linkages already. But in Turkmenistan, it's very half-hearted. And then in the U.S., it's really not, uh, you know, on the policy agenda at all. There are many members of the State Department and, and the like, and people who I speak to, I tried to get a little bit of insight onto what I did think was laudable two years ago, the U.S. decision to ban Turkmen uh, cotton imports, but there was sort of no real understanding on the policymaking side of, um, you know, how we were going to pressure them to, to change uh, the use of forced labor in that there, or what our overall goals uh, in Central Asia were. Um, I know that one of the questions was some, from somebody who, who joined late, um, so I'll, I'll just try to address that one directly about the, the probability of, of Central Asia becoming a proxy war in US-China Cold War. It's, it's not zero, but I think it's very low simply because of how far Central Asia is uh, from the US agenda. As I mentioned earlier, I don't think it would be a good idea personally, because Central Asians would not benefit, but even amongst the most adamant China hawks in the US, there isn't this talk about making Central Asia an area of potential competition with Russia, which we occasionally get, uh, with, with China, which we occasionally get with Southeast Asia, and which we get about Chinese interests, um, particularly in, in Latin America and, and the Africas as well. When Pompeo went and had that visit, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, actually at very short notice, uh, organized a quick tour of uh, Russia's allies in Latin America, Cuba, 
um, Venezuela, and he did get a, a meeting in Mexico as well, although not not as high level as those other two, and, and same kind of pomp. Um, and though that was his first visit to Mexico, and I believe twelve years uh, at that point. Um, so you know, Russia still sees that kind of activity as, as an affront to Russia because of its political rather than economic dominance. Um, so it very may very well may be that at some point we see real hawkish actors in the U.S. start saying, you know, okay, we now need to, you know, escalate the fight against China. How can we, you know, try to divide them with Russia and Central Asia would be a logical uh, point to look at, but um, I'm not suggesting that they do so uh, myself, and I'm in some ways glad that that, that is not on the agenda. Neva, we've just got a question about in increasing Chinese military presence in the region. Uh, it, it's an interesting uh, and question to put next to the U.S. story, which has been one of declining presence over the past decade, um, though still quite substantial, especially in, in Afghanistan. When you look at the region from a military perspective, you have Russia, China, United States, all, all substantial players. Um, how do you assess the current trends? What will the situation look like in, in five or ten years from a security perspective? I think the U.S. obviously has really high capacity to mobilize initiatives in Central Asia, but also its leaders. Um, Central Asia people will definitely support the U.S. U.S., you know, around the world has the strong soft power, and here is likewise the same. Um, for Central Asian leaders, there are two things. First of all, they, are, they have no genuine feeling towards, you know, China in the sense that they, um, they not genuinely love China. So if they if if you know there were ever happen to be a situation that we have to switch sides, I would I would doubt that any of these China, the Central Asian leaders would actually support China from the bottom of their heart in terms of you know subscribing to you know the Beijing consensus. And coming to the second thing is that you know the U.S. has the capacity to to freeze all of these leaders' assets which, you know, all these leaders have foreign assets in London, in New York, and, you know, as soon as you freeze the U.S. dollars, which is, you know, still the, the strongest currency in the world, China is not able to internationalize its own currency, just no, no one simply believes and trusts in it. So U.S. has, you know, the highest capacity still in, in Central Asia, I would argue, even more than Russia. And in terms of Chinese military, um, you know, increasing their presence in Central Asia, this is, um, this is true, and this came under the President Xi's administration. And, um, but I think this is not just Central Asia alone, this is also in Africa and also in South China Sea. But in terms of Central Asia, apart from arms sales, the, the one thing that um, is most unique in Central Asia is actually there is a, there has been, um, in Beijing, there has been a push to um, send Chinese private security companies abroad. And they do this by le by by putting it in the in the legal document that no Chinese companies should invest in a project overseas if they cannot afford the basic security requirement, which is to hire a Chinese private security company. Now there is uh, a, a Chinese private security company in Kyrgyzstan that's been here since 2016 and they have um, local weapon license storage and is subject to no inspection and no regulation whatsoever. The law is weak here as it is. And now my, my concern, and I think everyone's concerned in, in Bishkek is that, you know, this is a ticking time bomb. With this amount of protest, this amount of anti-Chinese sentiment, how will these armed Chinese private security guards who are often ex-PLA or ex-Chinese you know, Chinese police, how would they react to the locals? And in the long term, even they say it, you know, in one of their video interviews, they openly said that they serve the orders of the CCP. So they're not absolutely private. So how do we actually come to understand these private armies that China you know, is now plotting everywhere around the globe the, the official ones, the arms cells, you know, the, the military base, we can, you know, keep a really close look at. But the private security is actually something that will affect the, the citizens in Central Asia way more immediately than these military bases. Hmm, that's fascinating. And it'll be interesting to watch, obviously, next to Chinese PMCs, uh, Russian PMCs are also active in, 
in and Central Asia, and obviously the U.S. has many in Afghanistan as well. Um, we have time for one quick final question. We've just got a question in about migration. Um, obviously, there's a, a long history of uh, Central Asian migration to Russia for work. Um, maybe we can place next to that debates about uh, Chinese migration into Central Asia, which is much smaller in scale, though also politically impactful. Uh, in, in 60 seconds for each of you, if you had to uh, speculate on how these migration trends will shift over the coming years, um, what, what would you predict on the migration front? Uh, Max, I'll, I'll start with you and then we'll, we'll wrap with Neva. Sure. Um, very quickly on, on it's, it's it's a potential significant issue for the Central Asian states that the Russian economy and the Russian ruble um, remains depressed uh, over the long term, simply given the reliance on remittances. By most estimates, Tajikistan is the most remittance dependent country in, in the world, and Kyrgyzstan second, or, or at least in the top five. Um, Turkmenistan is the one area where, where it's Max, I think we're diversified. It has larger numbers of migrants from Central Asia away from Russia. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you, you were cutting out there, Max. Let, let me let me turn to to Neva to wrap up. Neva, sure. any, any thoughts to add on on migration in Central Asia? Yeah, I'm sure everyone is so surprised that Bishkek has better internet than London. Um, <laughs> so I think you know I, I got asked this question a couple of days ago as well: is will the migrant workers in Central Asia who no longer are able to find work in Russia go work in China instead? And the answer is no, China already has an abundance of low-skilled workers. Um, um, the Li Keqiang just last week said that there are 600 million Chinese, low-skilled Chinese workers who are living less than 150 US dollars a month. That is double the size of the population of the US. So will Central Asian workers go to China? No, will more Chinese migrants will go work in Central Asia? Absolutely, yes. Fantastic. Well, we've covered a whole lot of ground uh, in, in just one hour. So let me please uh, thank everyone uh, in the audience for joining. And let me thank Neva and Max for this very interesting conversation. And I'll encourage everyone to please sign in again when we have our next uh, discussion on this topic. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.